Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. My name is Brad Cartwright, and I just wanted to take a second to let you know about bradcartwright.com, which is a website designed for IB economic students and teachers to help you fill the gap between what the IB expects you to do as a teacher or student, and then how to actually do it in the classroom. So don't forget to check out the description box below at all of the different options that are available to you as an IB economic student or teacher. Beyond that, enjoy this video. All right, now let's take a look at the quintessential work in behavioral economics, a book called Nudge. And the nudge theory is really simple. The basic idea is that these choice architects that we were just talking about in the last section um, are, if they're in the right places, especially in government places, they can nudge. Nudge means to push a little bit, right? Push a little bit, push a little bit. And by pushing a little bit, nudge theorists say in behavioral economics that they can make people make better decisions without forcing them, right? Without mandating them, but rather, to provide them with incentives or information to nudge them towards making a better decision for society as a whole, as opposed to just optimizing their um, own individual consumer rational thinking, you know, uh, um, part of them and move people towards a better outcome for society as a whole. Okay. So nudge theory, let's take a look at a definition, it, a definition of it, suggests that choice architecture offered to people can be carefully designed to gently encourage, nudge, the people to voluntarily choose the option which is better for them. And this, of course, is pioneered by Richard um, Taller and Cass Sunstein's book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Okay, so thus was born the nudge theory. Okay. What is key to understanding in the nudge theory? Number one, consumers keep their consumer sovereignty but are encouraged to make better choices. Example, healthy foods at checkout lines, right? So consumers are, can still choose, but they get more information. Great example here in Santiago, Chile, the Chilean government a few years ago um, decided to put these these like black stop signs on all goods, on all food products that had too much according to them, too much sugar, too many calories, too high in sodium and whatnot. And as a result of that, they just put these symbols on. They didn't ban them. They didn't say they couldn't eat them. They just gave them more information that said like, well, hold on a second. This particular food that you want to buy is really high in sugar. This particular food is really high in calories. This particular food is really high in sodium. And as a result, they can nudge people along to make better decisions about their health, right? And it's sort of akin to your parents suggesting something but not mandating a decision. And over time, maybe you will choose it, right? How often does this happen? I mean, you know, your parents have probably influenced a lot of the decisions that you make. And maybe at the beginning, you know, you didn't really agree with it. You didn't really want to go along with it. But as you got older, you started making decisions more in line with what they n n n n nudged you to make. Okay, and so the notion here, right, is that the government is sort of like a parent and it's nudging their children, the citizens, towards making a better decision. Okay, but the key thing is here is that you keep the power to choose, but the options are made by choice, choice architects. You know, one of the things in parenting books is they say like, you know, allow your children to choose, but limit the amount of options that they have. So parents are choice architects for kids, and they might give them three options of what to eat. Do you want an apple? Do you want an orange? Or do you want a banana? <laughs> The kid's like, oh, I want a banana. Oh, yeah. Well, the choice architect, the parent, nudged them into making a, a, their own decision, but the options available to them were, of course, you know, very, very healthy. Okay? So that's like the, the, the key to nudge theory and the key to having you understand it, right? And what you also got to realize is that when designing the choices, the architects must help people override oh my gosh, this is a connection to earlier in this unit, right? They're cognitive biases, which means they need to change the system one choice structure. So system one is like that impulse buy, right? It's the automatic system. So if you are nudged over time to make good decisions, 
eventually you will, you know, and a great example of this is like a lot of people grow up not particularly loving vegetables, but then they become adults and they love vegetables. Why is that? Well, it's because they were nudged along slowly to start understanding that if they eat vegetables is better for their health than if they don't. And then they realize like, oh yeah, okay, this is good. And then they start behaving that way, right? So, so therefore by impulse, if they want a snack, instead of going and getting some cookies, they go and get the cut carrots or the cut celery or the cut red pepper that's in their fridge because now they want to have a snack and instead of maybe as a kid they chose a cookie, now they're choosing something healthier because they were n -n -n nudged along, right? Okay. A good example of this is something called um, Save More Tomorrow, which has to do with retirement savings. This is a sort of a mandated system that came down which, which meant that like, <clears throat> well, okay. So, Think about the cognitive biases, right? Short-term over long-term, hyperbolic discounting. People want to tend to want to serve the, the present tense more than the long run. Well, saving for your retirement is like the opposite of hyperbolic discounting, right? By saving for your retirement, what you're doing is you're not buying things now that would make you happy, like going on a vacation, but you're saving some of your income for later. So if some people, you know, uh, my dad used to tell me like, save 10% of your income. And he did save, you know, I don't know about 10%, but he saved a good portion of his income and he's lived a very nice, happy retirement because he was thinking about the long term. So the this, this Save More Tomorrow SMT program was a program that people could opt into, so they have the choice. But what it said is like, when you start off working at a particular company, you pay a small percentage of your income, um, of your paycheck to, um, to your savings plan. But as you move up or as you move along and you start to earn more money, it automatically gets increased, right? So you save more for tomorrow, but you set up the structure, you give people choice, but as it, as it, as it, as it goes along, they're, they're sort of nudged into making more savings for the longer period of time. And by the way, as you move through your working years, you realize like, wow, you know, if you want to retire at 65, you better start saving. And, you know, when you get to your 40s, you wish that you had started saving in your 30s, but you weren't nudged along, right? You were, you were thinking about the present tense as opposed to the long term. So choice architects, decisions are to nudge people towards ultimately better decisions in their health, better decisions in their wealth, and that will create more happiness, okay? So, however, let's not just sit here and say that and realize or say or claim that nudge theory is not without its critics, because it is, right? And we saw this when we looked at um, behavioral economics way, way back in the introduction unit, and that is that this is in the thought of in a way of like taking away individual rights, Meaning that if you are nudged towards certain things or, you know, think about the, the example I gave of the parent with an apple and orange and a banana, like <laughs> those are kind of like the same thing, right? Um, the, people, the, that child wouldn't have the individual right to choose a cookie. So when, when people start talking about governments, they get really picky because people don't want governments in their lives. They don't want a big old government telling them what to do. And so if you're taking away their rights to choose, even though it might be better for them, um, a lot of people in democracies are threatened by that, and so they don't like it. So they criticize nudge theory. It also sort of redefines the role of government. Certainly governments have taken advantage of their power and used it to, for, for not for good, historically, as we know by looking at a lot of places around the world. So if nudge theory is in place, then it's giving the government maybe more power than some people would be comfortable with. It also sets up a debate between free market economists and those who believe in government intervention. Hey, check it, those are one of the nine central themes. Yeah, that's right. All right, how much government do we really want involved in our life? We want government involved in our life exactly to the extent that we want government involved in our life. <laughs> like I want, I want safe food, but I don't want them to tell me what to pick. Well, what's safe food? I don't want, you know, like, the, like uh, businesses to be able to use certain cancer causing agents when they put it into their, to their food or, you know, maybe like into the chickens and so it gets into their eggs or into the beef industry, into the, into the cows so that you're eating a whole bunch of, you know, hormones that ultimately cause cancer. I don't want that, but I don't want them to then tell me what to, to buy in the end. So, you know, that's wanting government attention, but wanting to be control how much the government is actually involved in your life. Okay. So no matter what, what this has shown is that psychology can show us much about how economic models work and function. And that's the thing about nudge theory and the thing about behavioral economics overall is that psychology, psychology plays into it a whole 
lot. Why? Because we're human beings, my friend. And human beings are complex machines. We don't just make decisions like the same way all of the time. And behavioral economists have added that psychology component into the study of economics. That's pretty, pretty 